Welcome to Chapter 3 of Services Marketing. By now, you'll start to see a bit of a trend in the way the Services Marketing text is presenting itself, that we're building on existing knowledge of marketing and looking at how some of these foundations and even some of the advanced concepts are applied, adapted, or modified, and occasionally just you know, rolled out standard issue, inside services marketing. So the thing you need to be considering as you're moving through this course is that services is an applied domain. Some of the theories that were created for services marketing have been built directly from experience of service and directly for services products, services delivery and various aspects. Other elements have been adapted from goods-based and goods approach to uh, products and delivery. This means that sometimes when you're looking at a theoretical framework that you have encountered previously, say an intro or consumer behavior, you want to be mindful that is this a universal, applies to goods and service, is this adapted, it came from a goods origin, or is this a services specific theory? Just to be able to make certain that if it's an adapted or it's uh, a goods based theory, that it fits and it works for the type of service product you're dealing with. And you get that background briefing because we're about to talk about positioning and strategy and a whole set of concepts where we're bringing some heavy-ended high theory that's got some really good practical practice applications. Now, first thing that needs to be said is whenever we activate the discussion about strategy is that marketing has a philosophical and theoretical blind spot. The philosophical blind spot is that marketers quite often hold to the belief of growth as the necessity. The idea of if you're not growing, you're going backwards is a falsehood. It's okay, it's a lie. One of the things that we have seen in services marketing practice over time is the number of marketing services and service providers who have expanded beyond their capacity. In other words, they have pursued growth and then failed as a result of growth strategies. Instead of capitalizing, instead of consolidating, or also just saying, okay, this is the peak. This is as many service product offers that we can put out and offer the product that we're offering. So it's entirely possible that there are ways and means in strategy that do not rely on sustained growth. Our theoretical blind spot is that growth strategies are a lot easier to document, discover and test theoretically and test empirically than they are than any other strategy is. Uh, if you're looking at a theoretical blind spot in the whole of marketing, one of the big ones is that it's so much easier to test a new product concept and new product development than it is to test, if we do the same as we've done last week, will we get the same result? Because if you, the answer is yes, people are going to go, well, that was obvious. And if the answer is no, that's really depressing. So you want to be careful. The theories in here do talk very much about growth and growth orientation. Only go for it if it has a purpose. Don't fall into the you must grow, always growth. Uh, mindset. So the other area, competitive strategy, all right, we'll have a whole course on this. So if you've done 3023 strategic marketing, you're building on knowledge you already know. So congratulations, you get the bonus. If you haven't done 3023, congratulations. When you go into 3023, you'll be starting from familiar territory. Now, the key to strategy and all of this in services marketing, the big key is focus. It is about targeting. It's about narrow boundaries. It is one of the elements 
that you will see reflected in the assessment of this course. What well, I think I've discovered over years of teaching marketing is that market segmentation, market positioning, and strategic focus are really difficult areas. And quite often they're the areas that marketing students have the greatest problem addressing because you look upon this market and this market has thousands, millions of possible customers. And I say to you, you may pick a hundred, only a hundred. And people get really stressed and people find it, you know, I'm leaving money. You know, there's all these sorts of cognitive dissonance things. There's opportunity cost elements. But the reality is marketing is about focus and targeting. Targeted markets, targeted segments, positioning strategies for each target market. The more focused you are, you can find yourself then with a good focus, able to move into multiple markets because you are addressing each market. You are thinking about each market and its needs and how your service offering can be adapted to that market. If you don't have the focus, you'll offer out products that don't have traction in the audience. And you also run into the risk that you'll start, instead of focusing on the needs of the customer and the needs of understood and clearly defined segments, you'll start targeting your focus towards what can you do rather than what does the market want. And that's one of the places where you go away from being market oriented to becoming production or sales oriented. And it's a harder business approach. So key mindset for you, precision, targets, narrow selections, and being able to go, there are four opportunities here. I will take this one. Those other three opportunities are not the ones that I will pursue. So let's talk about your focus strategy approach here. You may find this familiar. It's a two by two because yeah, we're management as a discipline area. It looks a little bit like the Ansoft matrix. And that you'll notice is the number of segments here. We're looking at this from the point of view of target, a few segments, target, a few products, target many products into a few segments. Now here it's about decision making. You'll notice that many segments and many products is determined to be an unfocused strategy. You can do this, but you're better off basically, if you want to go many to many, just rack up a whole bunch of different business names and focus all of them as few to few. If you must offer 42, 100 products out into the world to 200 different target audiences, just break up the band. Have multiple, seg have multiple organizations that run different parts of this. It's much easier. So unfocused strategy is doing it the hard way. And we don't mean this in terms of, wow, complexity, I seek a challenge. We talk about this as it's bordering on doing it wrong. You can probably get away with it, but you're gonna have so much energy expended for such awful return that if you put that level of energy into a focused strategy, you'd have a much better return. So what you're looking at here is three possible strategies, fully focused, specialization, and service focused. I'm gonna push you back to the text to go through those and make certain you're conversant with them. This can, this strategic view can apply to your assessment tasks, uh, particularly if you're looking at your assessment tasks, also from the point of view of, uh, do you wanna be fully focused or specialized in how you approach your assessment? But also from the point of view of your case study, segmentation strategies are something that would be in place that you could review and look at as a possible element of your case study. All right, the market segmentation, again, you're getting a pushback to the text for this one. Uh, 73 to 78 year pages, read the book. It's really important, okay? 
We're talking about services marketing and segmentation, and it has a major impact. Because services are delivered to people, you need to understand who your customer is and what elements of your customer will be supported, enhanced, or possibly damaged by your service product. And the segmentation moves, as we move down into the semester and into the chapters, you'll see things like the concepts of the service blueprint, where it talks about the customer critical incidents, the touch points, where does the customer interact with the firm. The more you know your customer, the more precise you are about who your customer is, the easier it is to do these maps. If you're trying to map 15 different customer types under one umbrella view of the customer, it's going to be really hard to work these maps out, whereas it's a lot easier to produce 4, 5, 10, 15 different service blueprints for each type of customer segment you're dealing with. So read the book. You also know that this is going to be an increasing thing over the course of these videos is the pushback to the co-creation through the text. Let's talk a little bit now about customer segmentation. Now, one of the things about any market segmentation is you always need to give labels to your market. I cannot stress enough how vitally important it is that you have very positive labels for your market. Even, not just even, especially the markets you don't want need to have really catchy names, really nice names. You do not want to be calling the market that you don't wish to address uh, the dismal do-nothings, because when they hear about it, and they will, they're going to be particularly unhappy with you, and they're not getting value out of your product in the first place, but now they're a problem. They're a problem that you can't really solve because you've insulted them, you don't offer them anything in the first place, and now they're angry at you as well as not wanting you. So don't, careful with your labels, all right? Don't just, don't do anything stupid with your labels. But the idea of your segment descriptors here is that you're looking at working a map of a population. So you look at a market, you then divide that market into segments. You split up the segment by its percentages and its commonalities. So each of these has a label, a percentage rating, a single sentence, and if you cannot accurately describe members of your audience, members of your target segment in a single sentence, you've got to divide up that segment until you can. So this is one of the things about the way you've got to operate as a marketer and think is you divide and you subdivide. You look at what the hook is. What is it that you are trying to find? Are you looking for a segmentation hook around a core product? Are you looking around a common reaction to a stimulus? So a segment based on its reaction to advertising, a segment based on its reaction to pricing, are you looking at a segment that will react to a product offer or to a location? So you want to be thinking about this from the point of view of what is the value to make the core of the segment. The next element that you want to be able to do is you need to be able to describe your segment in a paragraph. So a name, a label, a paragraph. You can then go into you can set up a lot more detail after that. But also, if you can't summarize the key aspects of your segment in terms of what do they want as a product offer, what is their sort of sense of price, what are they, uh, how are they best described, where are they located, how can we access them, those sorts of answers. If you can't do that, you got to go back and redo your segments. Now. Segmentation as a theory in its own right is important. It is one of the core basis of marketing. Segmentation within services is critical because services involves groups of people, customers, clients, service providers. 
the right combination of segments will enhance each other's experience of your service. The wrong combination of segments inside the same service offering will cause both segments to perceive as a lower quality service. So you need to be thinking about who do I want inside my service at what time? What does this group of clientele say about my service to other markets that I want to be offering it to? So segmentation is very, very important in services. You need to be conversant with it and you need to be able to actually say, this is the segment I want and this is the segment I don't want. So the last thing I'll say for segmentation is you need to be able to look at an audience and say, who do I not want using my service? Because if you can't work that out, then you don't know your product's not precise enough and your segment's not precise enough. All right, let's talk now. So segmentation, targeting and positioning. We're going to talk positioning for the rest of this. Positioning's really going to be important in services because in the way a service operates, the nature of intangibility, the nature of it being search experience and credence as the three elements that determine uh, the impact of intangibility, competitive positioning becomes a way in which you can go and locate your service offer against other products and other services. So it's against brand, it's against value, it's against clientele. So the four principles are, as a competitive position, you want to have people be able to think of your service and related services. So those are the first things. You want to be positioned against competitors. It's got to be able to be a single message. Again, one of the things is that focus. Single, distinctive, and focused. And that's what your assessment tasks are pushing you to have to make decisions, to have to present one-sided arguments, to do a lot of things that require you to leave things out as much as you're required to include things. So a position, we try to create it, but ultimately it resides in the minds of the customer. Simple message, single message, very distinctive. You want people, there's distinctive and there's very distinctive. Distinctive, this message is mostly attached to you. Very distinctive, this message is not just attached to you, but it creates a gap and a direction you expect to find other messages. And focused. People have got to know what this service is about and what it stands for. So let's talk the positioning questions. First thing, what does the firm stand for? What, what do you offer? What do you do? Second, what are you perceived as in terms of price, quality, efficiency, reliability, assurance, tangibility? What are, you, what are people's expectations around your service and how well do you understand those expectations? The third question is, who is the customer? Right now, who do you have as a customer of your organization? Who do you want as a customer? Can your current customers attract or will they distract, repel new customers? Will new customers repel existing customers? So what is the, mind, what is the position that the current customer has? What is the position that the customer you're trying to attract, your new customer? Now again, this is assuming a little bit that you want new customers, but there's always a certain level of replacement uh, that you need to do in services marketing. So who is the customer now? Who is the customer likely to be in the future? If it's the same market, great. If it's the same customers, great. You can That is a legitimate question and answer. Who is the customer now? It's target segment four. Who do we want the customer to be in the future? We want target segment four in the future. As they grow older, we want to grow older with them. Because that's the other thing to remember is that triple, if you take Triple J as a radio station, its target audience 
has remained the same target markets of being the youth station of an age bracket, late high school through to early university. Listeners of Triple J grow older whilst the target audience stays the same. So if your target audience is 18 to 25, your 24 year old customer has two years before they're out of the target market. Your 18 year old customer has seven years before they're out of the target market. Now seven years of being your customer, that's a long term loyal customer who's just now, and seven years in, are they still the customer you want? Because are you still after the 18 year old? Or do you still want to then evolve your target audience as a sliding scale? So that's your positioning question. Are you, where are you in the minds of your customers? So your other elements you look at are your value offering. What is it that you actually offer as a product? So what are the services? What are the products? How do those products compare against competitors? And this is a really important question is, what is your weakness and your strength? Because if you cannot identify a weakness in your product lineup, then you don't know your product lineup well enough. Everything has a weakness. And in marketing, weaknesses are important. Take, for instance, high fashion. So we'll take the Tiffany's high fashion, big fashion brand. We'll take um, the low end. We'll take the Michael Hill jeweler. Again, we're thinking tangible product. But let's initially thinking, okay, tangible product, jewelry, physical product. Let's take custom made. So you can go to Michael, you can go to the Michael Hill brand, get a custom made ring. You can go to Tiffany's and get a custom made ring. What are the strengths and weaknesses of those brands? Well, the weakness of the Tiffany's brand is going to have to be its sheer cost, which means that not every audience is for you and not every audience is going to want what you offer. And that's a good thing. So your positioning on your weaknesses is actually a thing that you can do that is a very positive thing for your firm is to say, well, what are our weaknesses and do those weaknesses impact on markets we don't want? So you're offering a service, you're weak on a particular front that would appeal to a certain market. You look at that market and go, I don't want that market. Excellent. We should retain this weakness so we don't ever get that audience. So if you ever turn around and go, oh, look, my product's got, yeah, there are no weaknesses on my product, then you don't know your product and you're going to have a bad day. You want your, your product's got to have a weakness. It's got to have a strength or no one's going to want to buy it. But it has to have a weakness because it will have an audience that people don't, or people who don't want to use your product. And therefore, you can decide whether you want to continue rejecting that, deliberately and consciously rejecting that market by maintaining and defending that weakness. Every nightclub in existence has a genre weakness. It has its style of music it doesn't play. And people who want to hear that music, therefore, won't go to that club. Which is why it's a valuable asset to them of this club does not play R&B. Therefore, R&B audience does not go to that club. Therefore, the R&B audience isn't getting annoyed by the country and western that's being played at that club. How does that service differ from the competitor? Pretty much I've been talking you through that as well with the products. The positive differences, what do we do better? Negative differences, what do they do better? The important differences, what matters for our target audience in terms of what we do and what they do? And can we do complementary? Can we occupy a space that we know our competitor doesn't and therefore farm customers that we don't want? And this is the trick here is set up so that you will occupy your negative difference, the thing you're not good at, you can farm those customers across to another service provider. It's not a thing you want to do, it's not a thing you do well, know who does and send your customers who are seeking that particular product offer across to the competitor.
you get rid of a problem you didn't want, so you don't get a perception of low quality service. And also, if depending on the type of competitor you've got, if they see that as a value, they will start sending you their customers that they don't want to have to service. The weaknesses question also is, where are the opportunities to capitalize on your opponent's strengths and your opponent's weaknesses? And capitalizing on a strength, on an opponent's strength, is a positioning strategy. What do they do really well, and is that important to your audience? And if it's not, therefore, you can position against it. There's a lot of, look, positioning is actually one of the areas where there's a lot of thinking and a lot more devious thinking involved than you'd necessarily accept on face value. Third question up on the deck is, third block of position questions, how do customers in the different segments feel about the service offer? And this is why segmentation is vital. You need to know where are your positions in your different audiences and your different desired audiences. So basically, your positioning strategy comes down to three effective uh, plays. Points of difference, points of contention, points of parity. Now you don't position on points of parity necessarily. You can position on points of parity if that's going to be useful in terms of saying, we're just, welcome to generic university. We're just like the other people. At generic university, we offer you the same brands, the same subjects, and the same textbooks as name brand university. That's a parity position. That is, we are offering you a low risk, low cost, but just like the others. You can then position up on a difference. At Genericus, Genericus U, we offer at cheaper, at faster, at different. So you position on points of difference. Points of parity means that is a lower risk. You can say, essentially, we are the same as our competitors. Points of difference is, what do we do better? But also, points of difference is where you're positioning not intent. You don't go out and say, hey, we're worse at this. But you can. There is a famous billboard up in Brisbane, which is uh, a steakhouse advertises itself as Brisbane's worst vegetarian restaurant. Points of weakness. We're, don't come here if you don't like uh, dead animal is their positioning strategy, but they position it as a against the points of weakness. We're lousy at this thing. Come to our restaurant. So again, your strategic thinking here, you're thinking, you're having to think a lot. You're having to know what's important to your audience and how to use that importance to frame your frame your positioning. And your positioning comes through from a couple of other elements. So we've got the, the summer up here. But the positioning, the value of positioning is to start with identifying new product offers. What do you do that your opponents don't? What can you emphasize? What do you do that your opponents do also offer? Parity. So you're looking at what, you know, what's your level of parity? What can you then do that is different? Or what's important to your audience? You're also looking at things like your distribution strategies, the rest of your marketing mix comes into your positioning here when you're talking about how can we use where we're positioned now to influence the rest of the mix. And you can only do that by knowing your segment. So the last thing I point you to is I want you to go look at the developing positioning strategy because this is starting to be a case of draw together ideas, and those ideas must now flow. And this is your adaptation skill. This is one of your graduate outcomes, is the ability to pick up a block of concepts and use them. So here, customer analysis, competitor analysis, and company analysis. You should recognize these from intro as elements of the marketing planning process. They are internal and external environment scans. And they need to result in action. 
So a customer analysis needs to result in a segment, in segmentation, which then results in a list of decisions, which is the selection of a target market. The selection of a target market is informed by your competitor and your company analysis. So your customer analysis, external, environmental analysis, external analysis, analysis of current customers, informs segmentation, segmentation informs targeting, targeting plus competitor analysis and company analysis informs positioning, positioning then informs decision making. At each step, you make a set of choices, and those choices have consequences. And this is why you're being, in your assessment tasks, being forced to do things that require consequences. Why you have to define parameters in assignments. Why you have to set your own terms and terminology, and then stick to them. Because this is the cognitive training. This is the ability to go, I am defining this topic in this way, and then sticking to that definition helps you with the mindset required to do segmentation, targeting, positioning. So you're being taught both the practical element of I can think through and live with consequences of decisions and given a chance to try it out. So it's not quite wax on, wax off, but pretty damn close. All right, following up, following through. After this, do the readings. Again, you're getting pushback, co-create your education. Service Dominant Logic says a textbook is only useful if you use it. So you've got to read the chapter. You've got to engage in the chapter. Remembering that the chapter itself can contribute down to the literature review assessment task. You've got a course reading. Do your reading. Make your notes. Assemble together your, just got your notes in order, keeping your notes together because you're going to generate a lot of content for yourself this season. And think like a marketer. Focus, target, segment. What are the decisions that your assessment tasks ask you to make that means that when you make that decision there is a consequence? So you've got to start identifying those decisions and looking at what those consequences will be and how to work with those consequences. Now, as always, if you need me, over the email, on Twitter, through the hashtag, or come see me by booking a meeting. And remember, this is one of the cognitive, heavy cognitive load chapters, because this is a philosophy. This is an ideology. This is a way of seeing business practice and seeing the world. If it fits with your current views and your worldviews, you'll find it easier to adapt. If it's radically removed from your worldviews, you'll find it harder to adapt. So be mindful of any resistance you feel, any challenge you feel addressing the idea of positioning, of segmentation, of targeting. Be aware of it. Be conscious of it. Decide if this is actually something that's important to you, but also understand the reason we use tightly focused narrow markets and we use the exclusionary process and we proactively discriminate against the target markets we don't want by not offering them products is these are cognitive and deliberate decisions. We say we will focus our efforts, our finite efforts on a narrow framework. And that may not necessarily fit with how you see the world or how you want to see the world and that's okay but understand if it's not how you, you see the world or you want to see the world, that will be a challenge for you to use these techniques and marketing is predicated on these techniques. Cheerful end to the chapter, right?